This is the image that was recently released from the multi-billion dollar James Webb Space Telescope. It has collected light of these distant galaxies from over 13 billion years ago. It's expected to be from between 100 and 500 million years after the Big Bang. These are some of the earliest galaxies, stars, and quasars. What we're looking at here for the first time in human history, and perhaps the first time in the history of the universe, is an image of the earliest light, the earliest appearance of order and form and beauty within the cosmos. And also, we are reflecting upon our own achievement and recognizing within ourselves the possibility of having that very reflection, of seeing these stars for the first time and finding ourselves at home with them. Thomas Campanella wrote, I will make heaven the temple, the stars the altar. That is, he will discover within the heavens the stars which are themselves the source of the sacred, the source of finding our home in the beauty that we find in the cosmos. Today I'll be speaking about the origin of art as a reflection upon the freedom of the soul. Art can be characterized as a response that we give, a discovery, to the freedom of, that the artist has imbued in the artwork that shows us the freedom of our soul by which we find the ways in which we can escape from the forms that it, by which it judges the world. It's not just a reflection upon the object itself, but also what it elicits from the subject, and how it draws us to it, what it calls us to think about ourselves. In doing so, we think not only about that which we observe, but also about ourselves as the observer. We think not only about the object of the artwork, but also who we are as in making that judgment. And this calls upon a question that is deep within the history of Christian theology as well as ancient Platonic philosophy as to whether there is a shape of the soul, whether there is a shape that is like an artwork that is the very form by which we receive and we respond to that work of art. My thesis in this paper will be that there is a distinctively Christian way of thinking not only about art but also about geometry. Geometry is not a pure formal matrix that stands transcendently apart from the material world of culture and religion, but rather art comes before geometry, the poets give a first expression to it, and religious revelation is the genesis not only of geometry, but also through it of the various ways in which we represent that to ourselves in the forms of art. The world is stranger than we know. When we look across its horizons, we do not see its shape, for in every observation we grasp but a part, never the whole. As a whole, it hides behind all of its parts, and so it waits to be discovered in the study of geometry. Since Euclid, geometry has been regarded as the most certain of sciences. For until Piano's axiomatization of arithmetic, the conclusions of geometry alone had been demonstrated from a set of five basic axioms. Yet with the failure to prove the fifth parallel postulate, we have since witnessed the invention of a proliferation of alternative non-Euclidean geometries. However, after the subversion of the foundations of mathematics, whether in Gödel's departure from David Hilbert or Ludwig Wittgenstein's departure from Gottlob Frege, we can no longer assume, as with René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat, a fixed and transparent origin of the science of geometry. Rather, with the French philosopher Michel Cires, we can recall an older and deeper spiritual origin of geometry. He writes, quote, every single one of us has since inhabited the most immemorial of our universes, built from the spaces of time of geometry. What now continues to hold diverse forms of geometry together is nothing less than a creative dialectical circuit of positing axioms, constructing proofs, and analyzing these proofs in and beyond the founding axioms to alternative axioms within the imaginative matrix of the soul. As a source of the imagination, the soul is the prior cause to every creative exercise of geometry. In this originary sense, the soul must be simple and shapeless. Yet there may also be another sense in which it assumes the shape of its own thought. For if an effect is virtually contained in its cause, and the cause is enacted among its effects, then the figures of geometry must be reflected in the shape of the soul. There's a curious episode in the history of Christianity at the Second Council of Constantinople, when Origen of Alexandria and his successors were accused of having believed that the resurrected body has the shape of a sphere. Council's documents state that, quote, if Anyone says or maintains that in the resurrection the bodies of men are raised up from sleep, spherical, does not agree that we are raised up from sleep upright, let him be anathema." End quote. Most origin scholars now suspect this accusation to have been directed not to origin himself, but rather to the influence of Evagrius Ponticus upon the monks of Egypt and Palestine. Nevertheless, we find that origin writes in one brief passage in On Prayer. It is not at all necessary to suppose that the bodies in heaven should be formed in such a way as to have corporeal needs, since their bodies have been demonstrated to be spherical by those who have investigated such matters accurately. 
The scholars mentioned in this passage may allude to the followers of Plato. For Plato had in the Timaeus described how the Demiurge had, quote, made the world in the form of a sphere, having extremes in every direction equidistant from the center, the most perfect and most like itself of all figures. The sphere is perhaps the most perfect because, quote, the like is infinitely fairer than the unlike. Every point is equidistant from the center, and the infinite polyhedral faces of the sphere encodely contain the virtual form of any figure. We can, with this suggestion, investigate not only whether the soul has a shape, but more essentially whether the shapes of geometry are given from the higher ground of theology, in a theological interpretation of geometry, which we can call a theology of geometry. Like theology of logic, a theology of geometry proposes to analyze the axiomatic foundations of alternative geometries in and from the first principles of theology, of the divine logos, and ultimately, as this creative dialectical circuit of geometrical constructions proceeds from primordial intelligences in and beyond the imminent frame of the world. The question of the world is the first question of any genuinely philosophical physics. For as Plato and Aristotle had acknowledged, before any investigation of the causes of motion or the powers of bodies, we must first ask what holds the world together. Marcus Gabriel, a German philosopher, has recently argued that the world does not exist and that the non-existence of the world, quote, entails that everything else exists. For he argues that the world is a paradoxical set of the fields of sense, has no sense, and for this reason only objects have sense. We may, however, discover a hidden sense of the world in origin of Alexandria's work of systematic theology on first principles. After addressing the three first principles of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as well as the creation and descent of the angelic hierarchy, Origen turns to the creation and causes of the world. He describes how the world is not this compacted whole of heaven and earth, but rather, quote, the place which is round about the earth not to be conceived in the respect of the whole earth, but rather only in respect of ours, which is inhabited by the true light. He then contrasts the, quote, monstrous understanding of the world, united by nothing more than a compacted whole, with this true light by which he writes, the world is, quote, held together by the power and reason of God as by one soul. You can detect traces of Emerson and the transcendentalists here, as well as a sharp distinction between a conception of the secular world held together but by mechanical motion and a sacred or transcendent conception of the world that's held together by divine wisdom. As in Plato, this one soul of the world can be likened to, quote, some immense and enormous animal, which, however, is held together by the, quote, power and reason of God. The diversity of bodies is the product of all such spiritual intelligences, their primordial descent into material substance and their ascent beyond, as each, quote, becomes the servant of more perfect and more blessed beings and shines in the splendor of the celestial bodies and adorns either the angels of God or the sons of the resurrection with the garment of a spiritual body. In a leap to the transcendent, Origen also speaks of a, quote, world beyond this world. He writes, quote, there is no doubt, however, that something more glorious and splendid than this present world is pointed out by the Savior, end quote. And he describes a world beyond which is circumscribed to coincide, quote, within the limits of this world. Origen thus draws the essential coordinates of the world. He associates the salt of the earth with the light of the world. The salt is the element that endures in faith, while the light is the knowledge of that faith that at first believes until it knows. The earth symbolizes the ground of faith, just as the sky symbolizes the light of knowing. With these associations, Origen can be read to have constructed the basic coordinates of Martin Heidegger's fourfold, Das Kavirt, of divinities, mortals, earth, and sky. However, the sky is for Origen, not as it appears by Heidegger, a clearing of time, which is deferred to the future, but rather and more precisely as the light of the world. The world thus assumes a novel significance, not only as a totalizing aggregate of things or as the whole of diverse bodies, but as the emergent product of the angels and saints who collaborate with the divine logos to bring light to the world and the world to light from light. Origen's allusion to the city of the saints, Civitate Sanctorum, can accordingly be read to draw from the civic imagery of the central place of God in the Psalms, as well as to anticipate Augustine Epipo Civitate Dei as a concentric image of the soul in the church and the church in the created world. The place of art is the center of our attention as also the genesis of the sacred. We may with this higher theological criticism begin to analyze the figures of geometry. For in contrast to modern geometry, the ancient Pythagoreans and Platonists held the idea of geometry and all geometrical constructions to be grounded in not the mathematical imaginary, but more radically the theological first principles of the divine intellect, 
The idea can, as Proclus has shown, unfold to be counted and constructed into any geometrical shape by the imagination of the soul. He elaborates in his commentary on Euclid's elements how his soul unfolds from a single point into two, three, and then into infinitely many dimensional planes. Even as in the course of this movement, it can analyze its constructions so as to reflect upon and proceed again in an infinitely creative surplus. We can, I suggest, call this hyperdimensional or heavenly imaginary of space hyperspace. For in contrast to the three-dimensional Euclidean space, Plato and Proclus had conceived the space as shaped by a creative dialectical circuit of geometrical constructions proceeding from a point through a sphere in and from the ground of the divine intellect. So here I have represented what is sometimes described as the unfolding of the magnitudes, which is a neo-Pythagorean belief that is from a single in you know, one might be a, whether it be an idea or a thought, that there is an unfolding across successive geometric dimensions. First, in one dimension, the line, second, in two dimensions, in a polygon, third, in three dimensions, in a polyhedron, and so on, infinitely, in infinitely higher many dimensions. So from single, indivisible, and simple idea, we can unfold through successive geometrical constructions across dimensional planes into infinitely many uh, dimensional shapes. Here's an image of hypercube. Now, in order to represent a four-dimensional object, we cannot represent it in three dimensions. So just as, for instance, if you were a two-dimensional person attempting to represent three dimensions, you'd have to represent it in motion yourself. So similarly, as a three-dimensional person, we have to represent four-dimensional objects in motion. So we represent the hypercube as holding it in front of itself. This gives us a hint as to how it is that infinitely many-dimensional objects could unfold from a single point. That is, they would have to be in motion. They would have to, as it were, unfold from simplicity to complexity and from complexity back to simplicity. And we can imagine every geometrical shape unfolding in just this way, whether it be from a sphere which contains the infinite possibility of all shapes or in any possible polygon or polyhedron like a square or a cube. Hyperspatialization is the act of framing a higher dimensional or hyperspace. In contrast to the spatialization of the Mathesis Universalis, exemplified in Peter Ramu and René Descartes, sacred art unfolds from Euclidean space to hyperspace, in which the paradoxical representations of trans-dimensional spaces fold in and around these celestial lights. What we may say radically distinguishes a theology of geometry is the absolute priority of the creative dialectical circuit proceeding from all spiritual intelligences in the axiomatic construction of geometrical representations, as well as in every work of art. Sacred art from the Byzantine to the Baroque can accordingly be distinguished by proceeding from a spiritual intelligence to unfold beyond any finite dimensional frame as it opens a window into hyperspace beyond the horizon of the world, such that, as in the Lord's Prayer, a work of art can be made on earth as it is in heaven. The world is a work of art. As descendants of the angels, we share in this work of creation. And sacred art is an imitation of the divine ars or artifice, that is, the artistry of the divine craftsman, or demiurgos, who in the Gospel of John, Origen had identified with Christ the Logos. The world is, against Immanuel Kant, not merely a postulate of pure reason. It is not, as he had suggested, held apart in the domains of art and nature, divided across a transcendent chasm of regulated and constitutive teleological judgments of purpose, and only thereafter united at the end in a sublime expectation of a coincidence of knowledge and truth. And the world is, against Marcus Gabriel, not merely a paradoxical field of sense, for the objects can be sensed, correlated, and predicated in judgments and collected into fields of grammar and representation, the oldest sense of the object, the divine or spiritual sense, ever gestures beyond it to a primordial artistry of objects within the world. The world is, as Origen had illustrated, neither a postulate of reason nor an object of sense, but rather, as Plato and Proclus had suggested, a creative dialectical circuit of geometrical construction, a creative artistry that is exemplified in sacred art. Sacred art can in this way be distinguished by a sacred object of representation. It casts finite forms in anticipation of a paradox of infinite freedom. The shape of the soul is, we may say, geometrically fruitful in the plenitude of all possible articulations, even as it hyperbolically exceeds the closed horizon of any finite shape. The question of the shape of the soul may thus open to that of the city, the world, and the world that is yet to come. Let us discover the shape of the world within the shape of our souls. Let us, as Pico de Mirandola urges, disdain the things of the earth, hold as little worth even the astral orders, and putting behind us all the things of this world, hasten to that court beyond the world, where the soul freely assumes the shape of its every thought, will, and artistic creation. <laughs>